Yeah, I'm Adam Cantor. I'm a botanist with the Leoc tribe out on Table Bluff. And uh, we do a lot of different kind of um, activities with native plants and culturally important plants. And um, also ecological restoration where we try to focus on uh, culturally important plants that, that are uh, food or medicinal um, or um, used in regalia and other uh, cultural activities. Nice. So I'm going to give you guys a quick walkthrough of this little booklet, Fruits of Humboldt Bay. Uh, did you go to HSC? Were you all HSC no. grads? No. Where are you from? Oakland. Oakland. Got it. Down the road. So um, quickly how this happened. Uh, I was involved in leading protests against a factory farm by Cypress Grove. They wanted to move about 4,800 goats inside of a building. Mm. And I was upset about that. And I won. I succeeded in shutting down their farm proposal. <clears throat> Version two is they wanted to expand their factory on the farmland that they own instead of developing a factory on all the existing factory lands of Arcata. And I lost that one. They did expand their factory about threefold onto farmland. And they completely set aside all the land for no farming, which is frustrating. Because you can't farm next to their, their, their growth of cheese because that will aerosolize dirt and therefore this like, it could contaminate their factory use, which needs to be essentially petri dishes as opposed to so that little frustration went to this, where I said, grouchy, grouchy, if you guys are gonna do this wrong thing, you have to somehow make your land a little tiny bit productive for food. And so they planted a strip of land along the side of the, the factory that they continue to weed whack to death. By the way, anything you plant protect because the skin of a tree is its true skin. It's where most of the life is. And so every time you just weed whack off the bark, it's like just ripping skin off a human being. It kills them quickly. So they keep on killing the trees. This is the good result, though, because I've gotten to meet all 60 of these folks here who are the resources for this little booklet. And they plant this on, just like Cypress Grove had to, I plant it on the margins of my property so that people who have less food get to have food. A uh, tradition in the Bible is that uh, the margins of your land, in the Old Testament, leave the margins of your land for the poor and the dispossessed. You don't harvest the edges of your property. If fruit falls off your wagon when you're taking it to market, that's for the people who don't have food. Like that tradition of how a farm, because we have about 30 acres, we farm, we ranch, we fruit farm. Like I try to follow that 5,000 year old tradition of like, what do you do with the extra? And how do you think about the extra land that you have, the marginal, literally the marginal land that you have? So this, the goal of this is to plant for me, I'm trying to plant the Garden of Eden. Not a religious person, but very inspired by the idea of having a garden that you could walk into that was a forest, that was only fruits, and you could just kind of get lost in that and have a different vision of the world, like one of abundance and niceness. Um, I was raised on a vegetable farm, by the way, in rural Wisconsin, I'm a farm boy. So, I moved here in 1995 to help out with Earth First. I discovered that um, you know, there was very little local farming. It was mostly cow-calf operations, shipping baby cattle down to the Central Valley and doing dairy farming around here. And my wife and I started Tule Fog Farm, our area's first meat farm. That was for like a CSA, go to the farmer's market. No one had sold eggs and meat in the market. It's all vegetarian, which is cool. So here we have I'm trying to get three acres of land set up as a food forest. Like I saw in New Zealand, 20 year old food forest for every single thing in this big chunk of land was only foods. There was bush melons, which are things that you'll never see in the United States, but it's literally a bush with small melons on it. Got it? Good. So that was in New Zealand, which is sort of the, the a hot spot of permaculture, because next to Australia, where Bill Mollison was doing his thing, the permaculture books. In New Zealand, where I visited, I was inspired. This is amazing. And then there was that Cypress Grove thing. And so, ever since I got a book, I'm going to run you through it. Peaches. This is the number one best idea. People love peaches. There's five varieties here that don't have leaf curls, which means that in the winter time, it like crumples up into a little ball, and it kills all the fruits. So these are leaf curl resistant peaches that grow here. 
It's nice because you don't have to spray it then with copper to try to kill off the fungus that makes it leaf curl. You can just let it do its thing and the leaves come out nice and fruits come out later. And uh, as a career, I, I support multifamily zero energy development, the 100% solar powered housing. But I try to get peaches into my low income housing landscapes that I get to work on because they're the number one favoritist. There's nothing else I want you to know about this book other than, hey, there's here you can grow peaches in your own yard. They're killer. Um, fuzzless peach is what nectarines are. That's a peach, but actually they don't have the fuzz in the skin. It's a white, fresh peach. They are clean. Citrus are tough because we're just at the very edge of what we call California. So those two kinds of oranges, you have to baby them, but they will put on oranges. All citrus really get to baby them in the first four or five years because the, the frost in November will kill all the leaves. November frost, December frost, a little bit of January, but those are really bad frosts. And then figs. Um, Desert King, super reliable, everyone knows about it, but the Atriano has been proven in Eureka. And there's one third one that's going into, this is the 16th edition, I've got a 17th edition in my computer that's waiting, and then I'll have another fig. And I don't know what kinds of pawpaws work in Humboldt, but I do know they do fruit. I have a neighbor who just lost the variety tag. So pawpaws are native fruit to the Midwest and Canada. And they're the, the, the only temperate version of the tropical fruit family called custard apples. And so there's a lot of different things that have like a seed inside and mushy sweet pulp around them in the tropics. Cherimoya um, is an example. This is our North American, like super cold hardy version of custard apples. And they grow here too, very, they're slow in the sandy soil, uh, very sandy soil in the Midwest, not so much around here. Next page, unless there's any questions on the first page. Yes, sir. When you, when you talk about having to baby citrus over yes. the winter, um, do you need to like bring it inside or just throw a row cover it over Just the throw a, any sheet, okay. anything over them, piece of plastic. Yeah. It's the radiant heat loss on a super clear night it, the heat from the planet goes to infinite outer space because our heat is light, you know, it's radiant light. So in a clear night, it doesn't get bounced back by clouds. And you know, the consequence is uh, it's the ground gets cold and you get that fog that rises right at the ground where it gets super chilly. And that's the freezing frost that you're trying to avoid is those chilly, clear nights. And any kind of tarp holds in heat. It's not the tarp itself, it's just the act of the cover that will make a cushion of heat around it. The pawpaw that you know is growing here, yes. is there any chance of propagating from cutting sure. off of that? Sure. Everyone has names. So this one is on Robert's Way. The, if you look at the bottom of the little text, I try to tell people where they are. And should you contact me via email, I'll tell you whose house that is so that I can preserve privacy but get you what you need. How's it going, Gretchen? Yeah, um, I'd love to help you get more pawpaws going. I think that there are a lot that would work here. They work in Saskatchewan. There's no reason why they wouldn't work in Arcata. It's just they take seven years. So you have to know that you want it, you know. Like a lot of fruit trees take three years before they put on the first fruit that says much, and five years is really where you're at, and six, seven, ten years is when it starts to get really exciting. So when you're thinking about post-capitalism, like this isn't fourth quarter, revenue you're trying to earn. This is this long-term vision of, of commitment to your community and to the landscape and to your neighbors. Th this is like almost more than almost anything you do. The tradition this has been a way that you created communities, planting fruit trees. Johnny Appleseed, for instance, he was planting alcohol apple trees. And that was how you declared you owned a piece of land, is you had to plant a whole orchard of apple trees for Applejack, alcohol, not for fruit. And that was how you got your 160 acres and a mule kind of thing, is you planted fruit trees. That's why he was so successful, is he had your ticket to ownership. I've got the seed that will allow you to own this land and get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> totally about that. Next page, I want you to, there's a lot here. This, I don't want to use up my friend's time here, just so you know. Um, Cornelian cherry, I want you to focus on this upper corner. These are dogwoods not a cherry. They're a bush. Cherry trees reach for the sky. These things are a shrub. You can shake the tree loose and no fruit, no birds want to eat them. Like the coolest cherry. They're a cherry that sticks around and you can get. So 
those dogwood cherries, which come in both red and yellow, are a nice, sweet, tart, a fantastic jam. A real, like, you know, just eat them out of hand kind of thing. Uh, real cherries, mulberries, hard to grow here because of a cold summer. Same thing with loquat, but they work. Same with mayhaw. These are all things that have happened here. They're marginal. Pineapple guava grows north of Scotland. So you should grow them too. They are very successful and they take like 10 years, but dang. Like there's one that started fruiting at its 12th year at the Padawan Health Village, you know, the, the local tribal medical village. And it rains guavas now. It's 17 years old, 18 years old now. It's a real thing. Plums are good. People usually don't harvest them enough and they come on all at once and break your branches. I, I weave my branches because they're so weak. I'll take four branches, weave them together so they fuse and look cool, and then let them fruit. Because they, uh, growing up on, like, you have so many plums, you eat them all, and then you have terrible diarrhea for days. And it's like, so what about this made sense? Like, and if you don't do that, then they all the branches break. And you just have, like, you need to find some way to harvest them and, and share them. Plums are a shareable fruit. Strawberry trees are really yummy, kind of mushy. I like them though. Next page, we're halfway through. <coughs> Up on top, nuts. Specifically hazelnuts, which used to grow here on the coast. They're an yeah. indigenous crop. Hey, Violet. They're European. Okay. They're, done, they're both European and um, North American. They're, they're a species that crosses the ocean. Do you want another? No. Okay. Um, and plant them. They're very hardy. They're very successful. They, they fruit lightly, but they're a wonderful nut. You can barely buy them in a grocery store. I mean, a lot of things are like that. Um, pink fleshed apples. Top of the next page. Apples do very well here. You don't have to worry about that. So <clears throat> consider growing special apples. Um, Albert Edder of Edersburg, he was North America's leading red apple breeder. Coincidentally, he lived next to a guy who has a whole orchard, he's dead. Um, 70 years gone or something. But his orchard exists. There's still a family that, that um, harvests cuttings off of his original varieties. What he did is he took the Scarlet Surprise from Europe, and then he got all the seedlings from it, and then he would do the stomp test, like, is this a good apple? And then he just go through his orchards of seedlings every fall and try to find good ones. The Pink Pearl is his best. And the pink pearl you'll find in grocery stores now, and it wants to grow in Arcata because it likes cold summers to get a nice green to it. <coughs> Everywhere you go, there's a hot summer except Arcata. Everywhere you go, you're going to grow this apple, and it's going to get mushy and grainy in the summertime. It wants a cold, crisp summer. And so we are uniquely good at growing red flesh apple varieties, just so you know. And there's, these three are all at my house. They all work really well, Mountain Rose, Pink Pearl, and Scarlet Surprise. But there's more. I've got um, a total of 13 varieties of red flesh apple growing in my garden, but six of them, eight of them I got this year, so it's, I don't know what's going on. Next page. Pears. European pears struggle. Asian pears, quote unquote, do very well. Um, European pears have thin skin and get icky and cracked up. And the Asian pears have a thicker skin. So like a Bosque pear is a thick skin European pear and it does well. And same with the different types of quote unquote Asian pears. I love Shinseki, it's the sweetest, <coughs> juiciest, brightest of all the Asian pears. Quince are fun, um, they're very aromatic, you mix them in with like an apple pie. Blueberries need water in the summertime, but you can train them not to need it, you just have to slow, like you can go in the first couple of years. You know, and they always come root bound. When you take a blueberry out of a pot, you have to, trees are octopi. Plants are all octopi. They have their brains dislocated in each one of their root stems, and the brain lives at the tip. Just like octopi, each one of their legs is an independent brain. You cut off their arm and it'll go find food and it'll do things. It's alive. It's, and they're a coordinated brain. That's just the way plants are. They can count, they can remember, they can hear. They can, they, they, they can see, they can guide themselves through space, light and dark. They can hear the sound of munching caterpillars and remember the sound the next day and flood their leaves with, with mustard chemicals to respond to the sound that they hear. They remember the sound, they learn, they don't respond to some sounds. If wind sound doesn't make a bite on them, they don't care if it sounds like wind. They're much more alive than you realize, just slow. 
Like their nervous system moves at about one inch a second, which is as slow as slow like snails. They're, they're about the nervous system of a snail. But they have a nervous system and a brain. And it's root tips, the axial root tips is where the brain and memory and all the rest of it lives. So you unwrap roots when you get them out of a pot. You disentangle them all the way up to the stem. You try to get them occupied out in the dirt. Chilean guava. Yes, dear. Um, 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 never mind. Okay, almost done. Um, Chilean guavas from Chile, what I've done is collected all the Mediterranean type climates around the world New Zealand, coastal China, coastal uh, Chile, um, England essentially is a Mediterranean type climate. Uh, can. So there's like seven or eight of these ones are like Arcata. Chile is one of them. Strongly recommend this coastal Japan, coastal China sweet scarlet gumi. This is, it fixes its own nitrogen, needs no water in the summertime, and drops the first fruit of the year. And there's sweet tarts. You ever had like that candy, that dusty candy called sweet tarts? That sweet tart is just like sweet tarts. So, Gumis are my kids' favorite. They wait every year, it's the number one. If I was to put something on the cover, I would say, like, oh, I did, see? There's the gumi. <laughs> it's my recommendation. Red-fleshed apples, you know. Um, next page. I don't recommend most of these things. Um, they grow here, but currants get current worms, which is a, a soft fly larva, and eats into the midribs. Very hard to control. You know, lingonberries, uh, cranberries, wintergreen, these things, they do grow here. This is kind of boring, but I wanted you to know that they are real. But <laughs> kiwis, fuzzy kiwis are a rock star. Like, if you need a male and a female, but man, they grow like nuts. You gotta harvest them back. The, the fruits last until like March in your refrigerator. You can keep on eating them. Any pests I might need to anticipate uh, three hours south of Mendocino or that? Not really, no. It's just you're coastal, though, I hope. Yeah, pretty true. Well, I'm a little bit up in the pygmy, so mm -hmm. we get a cool. lot more sun. Cool. Well, this will work for you. It, this cool. is for a cooler summer. This is the thing. Almost all of these work everywhere, but these are the types that have also succeeded here, where hardly anything works. So not most grapes don't work. These are the grapes that do work. On this next page, and we know those, those grapes have actually fruited here in town. Um, you should be aware of the Russian Arctic kiwi. All kiwis are essentially from China. So the Russian one is just a recent variety. It's gone up there. The Russians are always trying to breed cold climate varieties, and they're one of the good sources for our climate. Any questions there? I'm rushing through because I just want to respect their loss of time. OK. Grapes. <clears throat> Next page. We have one or two kinds of passion fruit that fruit outside in Arcata. The one you're looking at is a native to the east coast, but there are also ones that are non-native to our continent, the Passiflora family. Um, hops and marijuana are actually very closely related, and um, the hops is closest relative, actually, is marijuana, coincidentally. So I just wanted people to know that you can grow both from around here, your beer and your weed. There. <laughs> you get grapes, beer, weed, the whole. It's <laughs> 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 just the beer, like, recreational. <laughs> Say again? Also plum wine is really good. Plum wine you know, and apple I cider, you know, the hard apple <laughs> cider. You guys are humans and following an ancient tradition are no doubt going to do I fun things. I plum wine with the shiro plums. Oh, the shiro plums are so abundant. So um, next page is, is blackberries. And California has been a center of breeding of raspberry, blackberry, tayberry, poisonberry. Like our California farmers have been the ones making all these new varieties that you see in the store, Mary and Mary, blah, 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 blah. They're just crosses and crosses and crosses and crosses and crosses. So we have a lot of crosses on this page, and there's many more that aren't shown here. Berries do, uh, cane berries do very well. Next page is some edibles that are native. Native strawberries. I think there's like six different types of bulbs, tiger lily bulbs that you can eat, pop them out of the ground. Um, soap fruit is more for washing your hair. Brodea and Tritalia are both edible potato-like bulbs. Down below, you can grow mushrooms in your garden on purpose. I have, other people do. You can plant like a log in the dirt, and they can send their little tendrils out. You might pop up 10 feet away. But I planted bluets, for instance, this one here in green. And bluets just popped up in my yard 10 feet away, and I've had them for years. 
So they didn't pop up where I planted them. <laughs> you know, I, I, they're magic, but uh, it's cool. Last page, hot weather annuals. We have one pepper that gets red here, just one, outside. It's a wicked hot mid-alpine Peruvian pepper. The hairs on the leaves will burn you. <laughs> so <laughs> just beware. <laughs> it's a small, hot red pepper. Um, Bunch of tomatoes, but certainly not most. You need like 65, 55 to 70 days a tomato will work, and those 85 day tomatoes, don't try. It's just, they're it'll just be greenish red and starting to rot before when the weather changes. Uh, same thing, corn needs warm roots. We don't have warm dirt ever. So um, if you're gonna do corn, there's a few varieties that have short cycles, like 55, 60 days that they'll put out of corn. And of course, grow them dense because they're wind pollinated. Can't grow a little garden of corn unless you don't get corn. And that is it. Any more questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, is this a place where you could actually grow sustainable things, um, like alternative proteins like soy, or you could grow beans here, or things like that? Is that a possibility here? Or soy that... really doesn't like it here. It's not very hot. Mm -hmm. Same as like corn. I'm from soy corn country in Wisconsin, where it gets like 90 and it's super muggy in the summertime. And... Mm -hmm. Soy likes that, so does corn. Okay. If you're looking for alternative protein, that's why we became meat farmers, is because we were so soy dependent, and mm. as vegetarians, like, this is ridiculous, we're getting soy from Iowa. Mm. Now we're getting soy from Brazil. You know, foul, we're out, we're not right. getting soy from Brazil. Yeah. So that's how we started our meat farm. Mm. If you're looking for other kinds of things, quinoa grows really well here, and quinoa is very nutty and protein rich. Oh yeah, the soap sauna, you have to like wash it and wash it. Yeah, mushrooms have a lot of soap. Mushrooms can be a protein source and really easy to grow. But all the mushrooms that we get around here are grown essentially equal weight to propane is what you're holding. They have to use so much gas to sterilize it. First grind it up into little pieces for mushrooms to eat. Sterilize all the media with gas. And then they grow it in a gas warm facility. So any mushrooms you're buying at the grocery store that aren't wild. They're, and I've done the math, they're as much propane as you're holding in mushrooms. So one to one ratio of gasoline to mushrooms in order to grow them. And I don't buy mushrooms as a consequence except wild products. It's very nice to me. Yeah, you just need it, and that's the truth. Unless you're finding mushrooms from a geothermal source, and there's like a little bit in Eastern California that are grown on geothermal, that's it. They're definitely a fossil fuel product. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chiantolis, you know, I don't know if last year they They've grown hard beans, black beans, yeah. Yeah. beans okay. for years that are just absolutely amazing. And I, when I first moved here, I was like, I can get local to no beans. Like, it's pretty awesome. So I think they grow those out in the Arcata Bottoms. That's awesome. So maybe beans and eggs. Oh, yeah. Chickens, quail. So, um, if there's any other questions, I want to respect our brilliant, super experienced, wise co-presenters. <coughs> what are some good plants for um, steeper slopes? Trees, you know, holding steeper slopes. Um, the gumi, the gumi is a rock star. Gumi will grow anything, it fixes its own nitrogen, it's a hardy bush, needs no water. I would fill up the hillside with gumi and look for anything else, because there's nothing that's quite as tough that produces fruit. Like Cianothus, our local California lily quote unquote, that's really rugged on a hillside also, but it's nothing to get from it. Right. Cool, thank so, you. Growing in the pygmy, mm -hmm. uh, is there any risk of, if I kind of go a little wild with gumi, that it might no. go into the... You know, if you, if you get gumi seedlings, if you don't get a true variety, yes, all over Wisconsin, a relative of the gumi is a serious weed, a serious mm -hmm. But the sweet scarlet varieties are not, they don't even have seeds. You can eat the whole thing. It's like a little piece of paper inside. It's like a seedless orange or seedless grape. Not invasive. So go for a European, go for a cultivar that's seedless-ish to keep things safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, Monty. All right, thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Oh, yeah.
extinct, even. <clears throat> and California is a world hotspot for native plant biodiversity. We have more species of native plants than all um, of North America, of any other state. Um, <clears throat> over a thousand edible native plant species and each local like bioregion or tribe would at least have 200 or more uh, native foods that they would consume. And today, um, it's very rare or, um, yeah, it's very rare to even see any native foods being grown. So, um, <clears throat> let's see, native foods, um, so, California's super biodiversity um, has evolved here for thousands and millions of years, and has gone through climate changes, has gone through um, fires, floods, droughts, all that stuff, and survived. And um, they're now in danger of going extinct because of our land management practices. And so, <clears throat> we try to um, point out some of the benefits of like using these plants in our agriculture system or in our food forests or in our landscaped um, urban areas. And so <clears throat> one of the great benefits of native foods or wild foods in general is that they can increase your um, food diversity. So one of our problems with our, um, our food system is that um, we're losing our food diversity. So like the majority of the world grows the same crops um, <clears throat> out of like 30,000 native or foods around the world, like a hundred plants are grown <clears throat> in our crops. And so <clears throat> native foods in one of the most abundant biodiverse areas can greatly increase our local food diversity. <clears throat> and they're all adapted to the local soils, to the local climates, to the, they just, they grow and thrive by themselves with the amount of rainfall that we get or that they find in their local ecosystems. Um, <clears throat> and native foods or wild foods are also super nutritious, <clears throat> so they're all super foods. And supply is mostly domesticated foods that have been hybridized together, um, domesticated for thousands of years, and over hundreds of or thousands of years of that kind of um, domestication and irrigation and human um, intervention, like over time, these plants actually become weaker. So in turn, their nutritional value becomes weaker. So the foods that you buy at the store are much less nutrient dense than their wild relatives once were. And um, so incorporating native foods not only can increase our food diversity, it can increase the nutritional value, <clears throat> it can save all these resources that we need to grow our non-native foods and um, they can support our local ecosystem functions. And um, worldwide, like ecosystems are in trouble and they're collapsing and it's because of the loss of our natural biodiversity. So um, you can incorporate these plants into your yards and food forests that actually support our local ecosystems and contribute to our biodiversity. And um, <clears throat> The more native species that you can incorporate, the more balanced and stable your food forest becomes, and the more likely it is to survive catastrophic changes, or climate changes, or droughts, or floods. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so thinking of your food forest as a natural ecosystem where things actually work together with like cooperation and um, companionship and 
symbiotic relationships that were built over thousands of years. Whereas if you create food forests with just plants from all over the world, they're, they just met <clears throat> when you planted them. They don't have that relationship that takes millions of years to develop. So <clears throat> it, it makes more work for you to make all these plants happy. Whereas um, a native food forest, they've all evolved for thousands of years and they have symbiotic relationships and it's like, it's almost an example of like a more um, higher intelligence of an ecosystem. And when you destroy that um, relationship, the ecosystem isn't as intelligent. So, um, <clears throat> so many native foods that most of us have never seen um, because California also has the most endangered species of any state. So, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and let alone like even if we've even tasted them before. So some examples, um, I got some posters up here. Um, one of my favorite berries is the Western Service Berry. It makes a blueberry kind of fruit. It's a larger fruit or small tree. Um, there's a California hazelnut, and the hazelnuts that you buy at the store are actually European hazelnuts, and California has acres and acres of hazelnuts. Nobody grows the native hazelnut. Um, there's at least um, three kinds of native cherries or plums that are native to Humboldt County, and one of them is called the clam plum. I've never seen it in the wild, but um, found some nurseries in Oregon where they are available. Um, <clears throat> lots of other soft fruits and berries. There's edible salad greens. Um, <clears throat> we have lots of native currants and gooseberries, um, and I've never seen any current worms in our native gooseberries. Um, <clears throat> so, and not only uh, forest ecosystems, but um, California is rich in many different types of ecosystems, grasslands, um, riparian areas, forests, oak woodlands. <clears throat> All of these ecosystems have been destroyed over like 95%. So um, just our native grasslands were full of edible grains, <clears throat> were full of edible seeds, were full of edible bulbs. And there's Indian potato bulbs, and there's over there's over 100 or 200 varieties of um, edible Indian potato bulb species. And California has lots of underground tuber varieties and starchy um, plants that grow underground and are super drought resistant and actually die from our summer habit of irrigating our crops and um, non-native foods. So. Sparky? Yeah. Like, how would you, I, I characterize what happens here as farming. Like, you know, the edible food forest is like a true farming strategy, considering that Central and South Americans grow tomatoes and potatoes and yeah. all over North America, corn is bread. Like, these people are master farmers. Totally. So, uh, in this coastal environment, people always refer to it as like land management yeah. as opposed to deliberate planting and farming. Yeah. And I'm wondering, Adam or Mark, if you guys want to speak to what you would call more deliberate, I'm going to plant this year and harvest it later. Yeah. Farming. So I think, um, yeah, most of California, they didn't necessarily have to develop big agriculture systems because there was literally edible food on every square foot of California. Um, so they practiced something more called like tending the wild. So they practiced um, land management practices that increased the local biodiversity, increased the local abundance of the foods that they wanted. And um, they did gather seeds of plants they wanted, control burn areas of plants maybe that weren't as important, and then broadcasted seeds of their special crops. Which and looks so, like slash and burn in South America, which is not a traditional farming strategy. Yeah, so California being like one of the most, uh, or one of the most,
had like the highest population of Native Americans and Native American tribes and languages and cultures, like their interaction could have actually increased the biodiversity here in California. And so the difference is, is that they're helping and propagating and tending native species and making them more abundant. And um, so, yeah, so they, yeah, so is that actually? The version of farming. I was yeah. Gonna, I will make the argument oh, for the, the version of farming. Yeah, and I think our new farming idea of like destroying ecosystems to grow food is actually, or it's already happened, but that is like very counterproductive. And, but like, because we came to a new country, we had no idea of like what foods were even there. So we just like bulldoze these ecosystems that actually produce way more food than our non-native or our planted farms. Yeah, um, my specialty has been in South America, so I'm just learning about you know the more North American context. But there, it's like they call it um, landscape domestication. We're so used to the European idea that domestication means a single species, where what's practiced here is that it was just the human. Uh, like you know, domestication of the entire landscape, which means you need that ecosystem to implement. Totally. Yeah. So like we're basically domesticating the whole world, and like there's more domesticated animals than wild animals. Um, so I think, and so what I think one of what we should do is um, incorporate native foods into our systems, ingest them for our own health, and. The more we learn about it, it's like we become we become a beneficial species of our local environment and our local ecosystems instead of like this separate species where like all of our food we grow just for ourselves and it destroys everything and we dam our rivers to feed it and and it's even less nutritious too. But like we can learn how to become a beneficial species and I believe humans are supposed to be a beneficial species in our local environment. Especially near the end of it, ramping up, I was just really emphasizing that inviting people to this beauty of seeing humans not as separate or not as now we have these new talents and we're inevitably going to use them, but really seeing, embracing this beauty of now we are a species who can consciously, lovingly interact with other species, knowing their strengths, their desires, their needs, and their potential. And uh, you know, pushing aside our mad scientist potential of ah, and I will let loose beavers in this desert area, and you know, <laughs> move the waterways in, and I will change it just because I want to, just yeah. because I value this more than arid land. Yeah. But just embracing that sense of we as a species now can become something very awesome and very beautiful. Yeah, because I think um, yeah, doing those things like we we don't have an idea of like what those. Left 
while we're like promoting all these points that everybody else does. Before you move on to Sean, which we probably should do pretty soon, I just want to, maybe I missed it, but I don't, have you actually like made sure everybody knows where you are and what your place is and what you're doing across the street? And I, I, I would just really encourage everybody, like mm -hmm. Desiree said, to actually, yeah. if you're interested in this, to go and visit Monkey at his nursery. So Red so yeah, we really create cool. um, native plant sanctuaries in Eureka and um, we have a native plant nursery that's open to the public Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from noon to six. And it's located in the Redwood Acres Fairgrounds. And I'll pass out some flyers here. And um, yeah, one of the things we're starting right now is actually a native food forest. And um, it's all native foods growing together. And we just started that last year. So um, one other point I wanna make about um, biodiversity and our food system But uh, excellent points made by Monty and Sean. And, um, you know, I would describe the native cultures here as landscape permaculturalists and farmers. And the reason that scholars didn't quite see this is because our kind of scholarly definition of agriculture is plant domestication. Domestication is when you alter the physical morphology and anatomy of a plant through selective breeding, like corn, which used to be lawn grass, sapola, just like most lawn grass. And so because we didn't see these classical activities going on, um, you know, early anthropologists didn't, you know, thought these were hunter-gatherer societies when they were really, you know, uh, complex uh, cultivators. And, um, um, one relic uh, or legacy that we see um, of kind of the selection that the natives were doing is in our rare and endemic plants um, around California. So a lot of our rare plants probably have um, ties to anthropogenic um, um, activities like the western lily, which is now a federally endangered um, plant. Uh, so uh, this is just talking about food forests and food shrublands. You know, I think uh, we're thinking, like Sean said, we're thinking about the edges of our properties, the edges of natural areas where we can start to enhance, um, uh, you know, the, the biodiversity, like Monty said, which, which just supports, you know, all animals. Uh, but even stuff like this in your backyard, you might have, you know, a blackberry patch that you think is annoying. Maybe it's a Malayan blackberry. This is... Rubus or sinus, the native blackberry. Um, out of Table Bluff, this is all uh, a wild radish or weedy radish. And so this is kind of an area that we're, we're trying to enhance this native blackberry patch by kind of repeated mowing. If you have animals, you can also do grazing and, and do some exclusions around the berry patch. But, um, you know, we us, we're, we're masters at uh, getting resources from the wild. Uh, this is Mad River Annie, and she has a bunch of different basketry um, items from a plethora of different species like bear grass, hazel, uh, spruce root, um, all kinds of things. And of course,
course, this is still important to Wiyah culture today. Um, kind of the first explorers to encounter uh, the Wiyah were given food items, uh, hazelnuts, chestnuts, acorns. Um, so, you know, the, the tribes were using native food items as collateral, as a trade item, as how we view money. And so moving, you know, the whole point of this conference, post-capitalism, um, if, you, if you produce everything that you need to survive, you don't need money. You can then start trading what you have with other people. Um, and here on the coast, um, you know, another kind of sign of, of anthropogenic landscape management is the contrast between our kind of dense, dark redwood forests and kind of the, the, the bounty that you find in the prairies and the ecotones between ecosystems. And so like, here's, a, here's kind of a, a monotypic Sitka spruce forest that uh, came up in an area that used to be known as prairie. You know, if you had this on your property, this is definitely a you know, kind of landscape that you can enhance as a food forest. There's not much going on here in terms of food. There's my Anthemum dilatatum, which is the false lily of the valley that I think, I think the berries can be cooked and eaten, but you know, not really a prized um, native edible. And so here's a landscape that you could just fill with vaccinium mobatum. Um, you know, just examples. These are examples of, you know, native sh uh, shrub, food shrublands. Um, this, is a, this is a huge Rebus or sinus patch uh, next to some, some hazelnut thickets. Um, just another example of this ecotone between prairie and forest um, that is just super productive. Um, berries, hazelnuts, crab apples, uh, the Indian potatoes that, that Monty was talking about. Um, so pretty cool. Here's kind of a native prairie. Um, you can see the Vaccinium ovatum, just huge shrubs kind of on this, this um, feral uh, prairie with just mats of kinniknik, um, which is a, a medicinal plant. It was also an edible plant. Um, and the early explorers just you know, talk about you know, kind of contrasting the the um, the bounty of the prairies and shrublands with the kind of dark abyss of our redwood forests. Um, and yeah, here's an example of kind of a of a relic Indian potato a garden um, out of Noel Dune. And what's really cool about the Indian potatoes is they they they're bulbs and they put off um, bulblets, and so. Um, Going back to you know what Desiree was saying about ethics, you know all the native cultures have gathering ethics, and you, we've read about these. And it's of course don't take everything, um, leave some for the next person, um, you know, and scatter the babies. And so these are systems that you know just to just be expansive. Um, you know that if you talk about tribes talk about these plants being as thick as grass. Um, and then just the activity of gathering, it's aerating the soil, it's dispersing bulbets, um, and that's all benefiting plants like this. This is Brodea terrestris uh, growing next to our native dune strawberry, and um, Sean talked about um, Mr. Edders. Um, he also did a lot of strawberry breeding, and, and, and a lot of our uh, cultivars are, have, have uh, dune strawberry as their parent. Here's just a couple different varieties of Indian potatoes. Uh, Fritillary, Finnis, you can see the little bulblets starting to pinch off. This is also called Indian rice root. Um, it's cultivated up and down the west coast. A well-known cultivar, a cultivated plant by First Nations peoples in Canada. Um, Diclosinia, the Ucal, and the little ones are the Brodeas. Um, here's an Allium unifolium, a native a uh, wild onion that has since become pretty ra rare on the landscape. Delicious bulb that you can eat raw. This is one that's super available, I think, uh, via our local nurseries. And it's very, very, um, uh, does well by uh, um, seed. So, you know, a more ethical way to collect plants is by seed rather than digging up bulbs um, if you have a big enough population. Sorry, what's the species name again? Allium unifolium. And it's a beautiful ornamental landscape plant as well. And there's the Fritillaria thinness in flower, and this is flowering right now. And then a um, uh, really cool rhododendron. This is known as Labrador tea. Uh, it's a small rhododendron columbianum. Very sacred plant to most tribes. Uh, 
um, as a recreational beverage. Uh, this plant used to be pretty common around Eureka, and it's pretty much been virtually extirpated. You can, you can see this in the Vecino. There's tons of excellent weed and bogs down there, but there's only one population that we know that's left on Table Bluff. And, you know, critical plant to basketry, um, the bear grass, um, and just another beautiful landscape plant. Um, sorry for the picture here, but this is an epic nettle, um, nettle patch out on Table Bluff. It's nettle with the Rubus or sinus, our native blackberry. And I've always heard if you could have one survival plant, it would be the stinging nettle. Just as a food and a me medicine, it's, and it's just a, soup, it's a super food. Yeah. Full of nutrients. And very easy to transplant. It's rhizomatous, the roots are uh, medicinal, and uh, uh, Nancy Turner, uh, British Columbian ethnobotanist, talks about how you know these nettle patches are correlated with old village sites up there. And there it is, beautiful. Go get it now before it starts to bolt. I mean, it already is kind of bolting, but you can find patches in kind of different um, phases. Here's our hazelnut, and I'm hoping that hazelnut will be a cultivated crop here in the future, our native California hazelnut. There's a big movement um, toward hybrid hazelnuts due to the eastern filbert blight, blight, which is decimating uh, commercial hazelnut crops, and our species since seems to be resistant. I thought it was pretty cool in uh, Sean's book, uh, in the hazelnut section, he uh, speaks, talks about speaking with the uh, Weot elder Cheryl Seidner, um, who talks about you know, harvesting hazelnuts when she was 12, but not since. Uh, the plantings have virtually all but disappeared. Well, in the last five years, we've actually rediscovered uh, these hazelnut patches that Cheryl was talking about. And they're, they're not a lot left on the landscape, but here's an example of a hazelnut scrub link out on Table Bluff. And uh, you know, this is something that we're trying, we're, we've been collecting nuts and trying to outplant and propagate um, natal hazelnut to basically Get it back on the landscape. Here's just kind of uh, you know showing the range extension um, of hazelnut scrub, which was only thought to be on the central coast up until about five years ago when we rediscovered it up at Table Bluff. Here's kind of one of the big thickets in a in a gully on Table Bluff that's being threatened by non-native Monterey pine encroachment and the absence of fire and indigenous land management. And this is flowering right now. You can see the small. Uh, hot pink pistils, that's the female flower. These are the male flowers, the catkins, and apparently it's not self-fertile, so it needs a pollen from a separate genetic individual to produce these guys. And they can be very productive. It, Sean says that they're lightly productive, but if you prune um, and if they're in full sun, they can be heavily productive. So these are not the same as the ones that are kind of out in the wild? Like yeah, Coralus cornuta, California. Same one. Same one. And it's known what uh, the, the common name for our hazelnut is also called beak hazel, and this is the beak of its simple root crop, which is the covering of the nut. And they're kind of actually almost like nettle. You can get little spines in your fingers, and we got to talk about how that was annoying, and they used to wear gloves. And a good place to see this, uh, one of the only public lands to see this kind of uh, hazelnut scrub on is at the Azalea Reserve in McKinleyville. Uh, which doesn't quite look like this yet, but here in a few weeks, I think it's going to look like that. And that's, of course, Ceanothus frisiflorus, uh, another beautiful native shrub in the western azalea, which all benefited from, you know, fire. Um, and so the, 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 the hazel, the azaleas that everyone loved really just sort of benefited from, you know, past uh, probably <laughs> burning practices for the hazelnut. And here's just an example of a hazelnut scrubland on a steep slope. You know, those peripheral, uh, what did Sean say, marginal pieces of your property that can be turned into just, you know, food forests, food shrublands. And, uh, you know, most species of insects have one or two plant species that they rely on to complete their life cycle. And that just cascades up through the trophic levels. And so planting native plants really benefits native insects, native bird populations, native small mammal populations, and the native predators all the way up. This is a, a really awesome native vegetation type, uh, rubus type, the coastal bramble, which is, is kind of a mix of salmonberry, thimbleberry, and the rubus or sinus, and uh, you know, 
salmon berries was, was a really important food plant. There it is. That's what it turns into. Thimbleberry, one that a lot of people don't associate as being like a real food berry, but it, it was. And this is also a rare vegetation type. So, you know, just as Monty said, a lot of a lot of these really important food plants are becoming less common on the landscape. Sorry. Long way. And, and here's just an example of how impressive um, the huckleberry uh, patches can get around here on the coast. This is uh, Leanne Moore of Oceanside Jams. She's got a local preserve business. She does all of her picking on her own with her family, makes salmonberry jelly, thimbleberry jelly, salau jelly, red huckleberry jelly. Wow. Yes. And of course, red huckleberry, if people know, it's, it's hard to really find a big patch. They're hit or miss, and apparently this this is a spot that's been collected uh, by you know known six generations plus of the yachts. So it's very you know these places have very very uh, special significance to the tribe and are living legacies of their their you know, care and stewardship of the landscape. And there's the earth shaped flower of the Ericaceous vaccinium ovatum. It's relative Valtteria Shalom Salau. And just an example of you know, a, a, a food producing landscape, the native coastal prairie, this is all soap root, which, which was in, uh, in Sean's book as well, with, with a border of hazelnut and pepperwood. Uh, bay nuts, of course, are a really important food plant as well. And then big leaf maple, which uh, big leaves were really um, important for uh, baking and, and wrapping bulbs in to cook. Just an example, more examples of, of native shrublands. There's a hazelnut right there um, on the landscape. And I know I'm almost out of time, but um, here's a food shrubland that we're in the process of recreating out at the reservation. We planted multiple species, uh, thimbleberries, huckleberries, um, hazelnuts, um, salau, and uh, this is a couple years old, and it's, this is what it used to look like. It was a big waste pit, um, and that's all poison hemlock. And so you really can restore these feral landscapes. It just takes time. Um, and you know, and another big point, uh, you know, I think of this talk is the value in perennial plants versus annual vegetable production. It takes longer to to grow an orchard. But in the long run, perennial plants require less soil disturbance, less management, and are, are more gentle on the environment, and become more um, dependable, reliable habitat for birds and insects. This is the same area. So this is, we're doing some Calamodrostis and, and other berry uh, plantings on, in this wetland ecotone that used to be covered in poison hemlock. It was overhead high with radish. And, uh, and you know, you can do this in your more domesticated landscapes. Here's a native windbreak that we installed on our garden that's um, huckleberry alternating with wax myrtle, which as that grows, it'll form a really dense um, hedgerow that will protect our garden. And that's something that I think is, is something really cool that people can do um, on their properties is, is you know, using native plants. All the plants I've talked about today are native plants, uh, native lilies. Um, here's our native, uh, the federally endangered western lily, um, the southernmost population is out on Table Bluff. Most likely the Weots um, tended this plant. And then here's a native checker bloom that was a, an edible green, the basil leaves. And, and this, this isn't flowering yet, but this is, a, this is a really rare plant in California, this is two checker bloom. A 1B2, um, it's beautiful. Native plant, and of course, uh, Camassia claw mash, which Monty has a really good supply of this if you want this plant. Probably the most well known uh, Indian potato or edible geophyte along the Pacific Northwest coast that you know, Lewis and Clark were fed when they crossed the Bitterroot. And just, uh, you know, a food forest. This is just out in uh, the Eel River estuary, a really beautiful cottonwood alder forest with just a Dibs understory of steamy nettle. Really fun to walk through. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know, more important plants, iris and mugwort, a really you know 
heavily used medicinal plant today. And you know, in another example of really productive coastal bramble scrubland down at South Bay. For Larry Finnis. And yeah, that's what hazelnuts can look like once they get big and when they're pruned and really taken care of. And this is Melba, we got elder out of Table Bluff, a hazelnut that um, she's cared for for a long time in her backyard, native hazelnut. Um, so yeah, that was quick. I think that's all I have. If anyone has any questions? You said that salt area is the longest on The berries are edible. They are edible? Mm -hmm. okay. And a lot of people don't know that. It's actually one of the, so many people look at me like I'm crazy and they're going to tell me <laughs> something okay. poisonous. They're really good. They have like kind of a little, they're a little seedy, but um, they're absolutely delicious. And uh, you know, all the tribes kind of love Salau, and it was a well known uh, eaten berry. It was mixed with um, hazelnuts and salmon and kind of a mush. Sounds really yummy. Uh, that might, uh, come from, uh, the gooseberry, like our, mm -hmm. our variety sanguinea, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't really taste very good. No, <laughs> no, but, and so yeah. So how do we uh, use it? Um, I would say pick another berry. Um, <laughs> uh, cook it and put sugar on it. Uh, no, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so what, I, for, what I've gathered, um, Ribes sanguinium was not the preferred gooseberry. Um, the black coast black currant is a, is just like a little sugar burst. Um, Ribes lacustri, or is it divarcatum? I can't remember. Divarcatum, and that one is is actually it's not a rare plant, but it, it has become less common on the landscape. So, yet another one that it would be good to plant in your yard, in your garden, both those Ribes lacustri and. And my other part was um, I've seen one of those be at the bog at Wiki Wiki. Mm -hmm. Wiki. Nice. Um, so it's nice to see out there. That is. And uh, yeah, Big Lagoon is kind of a place um, you can go and, and kind of see what what it used to look like. But the, the picture of the spruce forest I showed um, was from Big Lagoon. And you can look at old maps and, and aerial photographs. And, and most of the area around Big Lagoon was all prairie not that long ago. Mm -hmm. and, and that spruce forest has and come up in the last hundred years. That's been managed heavily by the Weehawk guy. Yeah, by the by the Yurok. Yeah. Oh the Yurok. Yurok, yeah. That's the southern southern part of Yurok. And the Moonstone Beach is the border between the Weehawk and the Yurok, but they're um, they were both Algic Algonquin tribes, so they um, were friendly, intermarried and and went to each other's parties and stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I can't stress enough, you know, go out to Monty's Nursery, uh, get some native plants. Uh, there's a handful of native nurseries. Um, and come out to the Wildflower Show next weekend um, in uh, Eureka at the Jefferson Center. And I'm going to have a native plant uh, display there where I'm going to have a bunch of these plants um, on display. Yes, it is the time for gardening. So, yeah, and um, yeah, I just want to thank the conference folks for all having us here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.